أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقد يشرح في صدر ويصير العمل وحل لقية من الإسلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله الحمد لله العليم الحكيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي خلق كل شيء وأحسن ما خلقه وهو العزيز الحكيم وهو الغفور الرحيم Alhamdulillah, who has created all things and made everything perfect. One of the things, a couple of foundations, um, just to reestablish, going into like part two, what I didn't finish last week, that the universe is created in perfection. Everything is in a state of perfection as Allah created it. So that when we see problems within ourselves as human beings, or problems in the outer atmosphere, in the cosmos, we understand this didn't come from Allah God, because Allah created everything perfect. And pretty much everything that we see, um, primarily the result of human activity, but we also can say human and jinn, because we're the only ones, we're the only two aspects of the creation that have free will. So we can make choices, and very often our choices create havoc um, in the universe. You know, one brother said, all things go back to the garden, back to the the garden that Adam and Eve lived in uh, when Allah created them. And we know that uh, the other jinn were created before us. So in that garden was our enemy, Shaitan. So everything goes back to that um, instigated disobedience that Shaitan instigated Adam and Hawa to disobey Allah. So as these things happen, that's what creates the imbalance, the imperfection, the chaos in the universe. And um, nobody should ever say, well, this is the will of Allah, this is, you know, just the way that Allah wants. No, that's not so. Allah left us to make choices. He knew what we would do, but, you know, he's waiting for the human beings to, for us to get ourselves back into balance, back in, at least striving for that state of perfection that would bring things back into balance. So, one of the things, and just let me say that, alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to Allah to allowing me to share some things with you, but I'm also grateful to all of you that take the time, took the time to come and to listen. Um, last time, we got up to law number five. So the topic is the seven laws of healthy living, the seven laws of health. And we got up to law number five, but I went back and looked and I realized that there were a couple of things that I forgot to mention. So with just a little bit of review and also um, putting in a few things that I forgot, that I just uh, want to start. So we're talking about laws. And as I said last time, laws are either a rule or a set of rules that are established by an authority, someone that has authority to put laws into effect and then to um, try to ensure that those laws are obeyed. So every law that exists within our bodies, within the universe, is established by Allah. These are universal laws. And these are laws that must be maintained must be obeyed and have to be maintained because without that our physical bodies go into um, like um, almost a state of chaos and things start to break down and the whole universe goes into that if the laws are not maintained by us. We don't really truly break the laws because the law is going to, the whole universe is always working to reestablish itself the way that Allah wanted it and our bodies doing the same thing. What happens though is we will end up destroying ourselves. So. But as we see now, we can almost also break down the universe. So um, in the first law, which was the law of air, as we know that when we are born or come out of the uh, the, the bellies of our mother or come from the rahm of the, of the mother, the first thing we need is air. And, um, and so the first thing that we need to do is to take a breath, or the, the inhalation and exhalation that we have to, I'm just trying to get down to that level there. Um, the inhalation that we, in, inhalation and exhalation we have to take just to establish our life in this world outside of the water world that we were living in in, in vitro, in the, in the uterus. So in that law of air, um, I didn't, what I didn't mention, and, and again, that remember that the air is, 
is something that Allah has established as part of our environment. It's kept in balance by Allah Ta'ala, and it has a structure. I mean, everything has a structure, so there are gases in the air that must stay in balance, right? And even in our breath, our inhalation and exhalation, there's a balance that needs to be maintained, which is part of the mizan, the balance, the, the whole balance of the universe, which is, is part of the law. But in that law of air, there are um, times in the day, in each day, when the lungs are working better and, and regenerating themselves more than any other time of the day. And that is in that time between 4 and 6 a.m. This, this is another one of the laws. Every system in, in our bodies has a time of the day that it regenerates. And so the lungs regenerate more than any other time between 4 and 6 a.m. And when you think about that in, in terms of the spiritual self, because remember that we are physical, mental, emotional, and um, spiritual. So when you think of this in terms of our spiritual selves, and you think of all the faith groups, I came out of Catholicism, and I know that in Catholicism, the priests, the monks, the nuns that were in cloister, and even some of the nuns that were our teachers, they would get up and do special worship in that real early time, they called it matins, and in that real early time of the day. Martial artists, when they want to be at their best, when do they go out and practice? In that real early morning. Um, and for us as Muslims, tahajjud. This is the time when Allah Ta'ala is saying, get up, servant of mine. You know, so there's a, and there, and the season, so the time of the day when our lungs are regenerating, and it's good for us to get up and practice breathing with ibadah, uh, is 4 to 6 a.m. The season when the lungs regenerate is fall. And so when you think about what is the characteristic of autumn and fall, the winds, right? The winds. We talk about the, the air in the fall, how the and the winds come and begin to change things. And so um, that's the time when our lungs are regenerating and Allah is bringing in uh, clean, cleaning, like cleaning the air by the movement of the winds. So there are signs in the creation of Allah as to the laws that he has established. And then also, air is not the same all times of the day. So we said when the lungs are, are uh, regenerating in that 4 to 6 a.m., always that is a portion of that 4 to 6 a.m. is a portion of the Hajj, all year round, a portion of it. Because Fajr never comes before 4 a.m., not here anyway, I don't know, maybe in other places it might. But, um, so a portion of that 4 to 6, a portion of that lung generation time is in the time of Salat of Tahajj. Now in the, um, Tahajj is the last third of the night, right? and it's mentioned in Quran in Surah Al-Isra. Uh, in a lot of saying in Surah Al-Isra, and in the night, like we do the Salat of the Hajjid. Because he's saying, um, perhaps your Lord will elevate you to um, a, praise, a, a place of praise, elevate us to a different status in that if we get up for the Tahajjid. So um, there's a hadith in. It's Hadith al-Qudsi, I guess, in the, what's called the, the pure or holy Hadith, that uh, it says, Yatanazzalu Rabbuna. Our Lord, our Lord comes, Yatanazzal. It's, it's like the verb nazala, which is, means to come down. Like it says, Our Lord descends in the um, last third of the night. Tabarakah wa ta'ala. Yatanazzalu Rabbuna, Tabarakah wa ta'ala. Kula laylatin, every night, each night, when there's just a third of the night left. Uh, when just a third of the night is left. And what there's three questions it says in this hadith that Allah will ask in this third of the night. The first one is who's making dua? Who's making dua? So, then I will answer them. Who is calling on me? Basically, who's calling me with dua so that I can answer them? The second question says, uh, Man yes who uh, who's asking something of me so that I can give it to him. Allah says I will give it to them. And then the third one is says, Man yastaghfiruni, who's asking or seeking forgiveness of me, so that I can forgive that one. So Allah's asking these three questions, and they say there's a saying that the bones of the believers 
um, get restless in this last third of the night. So you find some people say, I'm always waking up. I don't know. I look at the clock and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm so mad. Why am I waking? It's because something is calling us, you know. So if you're a mu'min, if you're a believer, you understand that. And you say, okay, I'll, you don't really want to get up. But you say, I understand you're calling me. And so I need to get up. So this is the thing. And how you figure out that is you just take the time from the Isha, when Isha starts, which now is like 7.10, to the beginning of the Fajr which is now like 5.30, and you, can, you measure that time and then divide it into thirds. And then you know what is the last third of the night, which is the time for, you know, even if you get up a half hour before Fajr, an hour before Fajr, two hours before Fajr, but sometime in that last <coughs> third is a time when we should get up. Now, the thing about the air, the, the quality of the air actually changes in that last third. And that is measured scientifically. I mean, that actually can be measured that the components, how the air is arranged, or the beneficial gases in the air, some, they change in that last third of the night so that the air is different. So that whole thing about getting up, opening up your window, door, something, patio or whatever, and try to get some of that air into your lungs because that's when your lungs are regenerating. That's when the presence of the law is stronger in the, in the universe and is a time, or at least in our part of the universe where it's night because on the other side of the earth it's day, right? So um, it's a time for us to exercise and be conscious of that regeneration of the lungs. Another thing that I didn't mention was that from the time, okay, our life begins as soon as our life is generated in the womb. But in terms of the air, in terms of the breath, this is one of the measures of our life outside of the womb of our mothers until we die. Because our first breath begins there, and until we take that final breath, that breath is a measure of our life. And Allah Ta'ala has measured it. Every single breath, every inhalation, exhalation, is a measure of our life, just like our heartbeat. So our life is measured by two things, the breath and the heartbeat. So the medical profession that tries to talk about brain dead and whatever, whatever, that is no measure of life and death as far as we're concerned. Our life is measured by our breath and our heartbeat. And until those things are taken away from us, we have life. So, um, so no, if you get into a situation where you have to make a decision, a life and death situation, best on, based on someone that's sick, don't let them tell you anything about brain dead. Actually, the brain is, you know, as long as our hearts are beating, there's life in our bodies. The heart is still beating in, in many of those cases. And when they're in fact, it is. When they're talking about brain dead, your heart is still beating. And they just want to um, basically kill you and take your organs for the most part. So, um, all right, so the second, were there any questions before I go on about this air and breath and all that? Eric, hey, could you uh, put, put them on the board again because I think some people weren't here last week. Okay, okay, the laws you mean? Yes. Okay, so the first law is that law of breath, air. Again, when we're talking about these laws, remember these are laws established by a law, and these are universal laws across the board for everybody, every human being, health and healthy living. I got a question on why you're writing. Ed here. All right. Yes. Yes, I got a question on why you're writing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it happens to me often, and so um, is there significance, I guess, in like, I hate to sound lazy or whatever, but I get up, think about making a prayer, of course, uh, this is like before the fall, right, the mm -hmm. one we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sometimes, I, I guess, coming from a Christian thing, they be like, well, they can hear you anyway, so I'll be like, okay, well, I'm really just, I guess, I'll say too lazy, but just to, uh, to make the duwa, just sit there and in, open. In the bed? Yeah, as opposed to getting up. And well, I mean, that's up. better than nothing, right? Cool. I mean, so something is better than nothing. So um, if you wake up and you say, and you look at your clock and you realize that it's tahajjud and you say, and you start making tasbih, du'a, or something like that, that's better than just turning over and saying, I don't want to wake up, I just want to go back to sleep. You know, so... Um, 
that's better than nothing. Of course, getting up, getting up, getting out of the bed, because Allah Ta'ala talks about the, those of us who get up, get out of the bed, leave, abandon the bed. It's, it's a, something, a phrase in Quran that means like abandon the bed, you know, to leave the bed, to actually get up. So that's better. And, and the Prophet said, uh, you know, those who are up when others are sleeping, that's one of the qualities of getting into Jannah. That, you know, other people are asleep, but we're up. And, and we have to do that. This is one of the reasons why it's going to be easier for us to come out of our graves, Yom Qiyama, because we've been used to awakening to the call of Allah. We've been used to getting up uh, for the ibadah. We get up, it's not just we get up to go to work or we get up whatever, we get up for ibadah. We get up to worship. So when the call is made, we're more responsive. So it's going to be easier for us, where it's going to be hard for other people. Um, we're going to suffer a lot coming out of the graves. So, breath is a measure of our life, and breathing is, is breathing properly is very important. And I mentioned last time too that the breath should not be up here. You know, you shouldn't be breathing between your rib cage and your throat. Your breath should be down into the, the lower abdomen. That's a healthy breath. That's a better breath because when you're breathing shallow, you're sending a message of fear to your body, and then you start setting up conditions for disease or problems with your organs. And also the organ of the, um, not the organ, but the emotion that um, works against the health of your lungs is sadness. And you know, this is something, it's, it's easy to be sad, but the thing for the Muslim is you don't stay in sadness because we always have hope. And because we have hope in Allah, it takes us back up into um, a state of happiness or joy. And there are other things that help with that, so in, in the laws. So let me, so, okay, so law number one is there. And, and again, to remember that um, air in your home is not improved by these silly things like Febreze and Glade and all that stuff. So those actually work against the health of your lungs. And by the way, I did bring some um, charts of the organ regeneration, not just of the lung, but all of the organs that I'll Hopefully I have enough. Which is not many people. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, and, and to remember that the air in the body, taking in a pure air, it calms you. So that's the thing about breathing deeper. It calms the body, sends that message of peace. And um, you'll sleep better if you breathe better. And your digestion will be better uh, with your breath as you breathe well. Which is one of the reasons when we get into that uh, law of diet, why the Prophet Sallallahu said, leave enough room for a good breath after you eat. Don't, don't eat so much that you can't take a comfortable breath because the breathing actually helps your digestion. So that's you know, how all these things work together. Okay, so then the second law is the law of water. Um, again, I'm sort of reviewing a little bit and adding in what I might have forgotten. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each one of them. But the thing, I think the thing about water is that we want to remember there is no life without water. So when you think you don't need water, you just want to drink, you know, whatever, Hawaiian punch, <laughs> Coca-Cola, your, your kidneys don't work on those things. Your kidneys have to have pure water. So you have to be sure that the greatest amount of liquid that you take in is water, understanding that your body is over 75% water and needs pure water to function. So, um, and that, to remember that water is one of the barakah, it's actually one brother called it the ni'mah. Not just a barakah, not just a blessing, but a ni'mah. It's, it's like something good that Allah has instilled for us. And you know, it's a shame now that we have to pay so much for water because it is free from Allah Ta'ala. And many ayat in the Quran says, you know, that Allah uh, he sends the water down from the heaven. And scientists have realized that water comes from outside of our atmosphere. It's not um, initiated or originated inside of the Earth's atmosphere. And nobody knows from where it comes. So, and this is, this is a thing that it's, but we know where it's, it's coming from Allah. That Allah has created this and he has generated life from it. So all life depends on water. You don't have water, you don't have life. That's just period. You don't have water, you have death. Um, and you know, when they look at some of the other planets, when they're looking at them, they're looking for signs of water because they know that no life can be sustained on them. 
as a, without water. NASA knows that. You know. And if, if we're wise, we will think more about um, water also. But one thing that I do caution against is becoming I was anxious about the water or too concerned, you know, you want, you want uh, what is that, re reverse osmosis or you want alkaline. alkaline or you want water that comes out of Fiji or France or wherever. Um, the thing about water is that it is very responsive to us because it is here to serve us. So I do believe in trying to get pure water because that's important. We, we should not uh, be willing to consume water that doesn't have some sense of purity to it or some quality of purity. So, but there are things you can get, right? Brita pitchers or some type of filters or installing a filter in your home to try to filter some of the chemicals out of the water. But beyond that, this is my personal opinion that if we recite Surah Al-Fatiha and anything else from the Quran, Ayatul Kursi, Kul Surahs, whatever, if you recite these things over your water, the water will change and become more pure for your body because it is a servant. It's there to serve you. And this is the thing to begin to look at the creation of Allah as it is. It is created to serve us. You know, Allah says, خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He created for us everything that's in the heavens and the earth. So these things are there as servants for us. So that's, that's my personal belief. And you know, there's a long history of reciting Quran over water for healing. And that, you know, you, you recite the Quran in, over the water and you have the sick person drink it. And that's whether they're physically sick, mentally sick, have a sahar or jinn, you know, this water is used as a purification of whatever may be wrong with them. Even to uh, some of the uh, shuyuk, the shaykh, they will say, uh, recite the Quran on the water and do your wudu with it, you know. So that this helps to um, take away negative energy that maybe have gotten around you or negative things on your body. So um, that's, that's how I believe. I don't believe we should spend a whole lot of money. I don't believe we should be getting imported water, uh, all of this type of stuff, but just try to do the best you can and then recite Quran on the water. I was in Sudan when I was living in Sudan for a while and I went to visit a clinic where they were healing and they, people, they had um, prophetic medicine and they had western medicine and when people weren't responding to either one of those, then they would send them to the special room where, and they had this, I call them the tag team, tag team uh, shake group, you know, they, there were like three of them, three reciters. And they, one was like real soothing and soft, they would come in and recite Quran, soothing and soft. But through all three of them, on the table there was pitchers of water. And so the second one was a little more powerful, and the third one was like the po real power guy to come in and recite Quran real forcefully and strong to knock whatever their, you know, shayqeen or whatever was bothering these people. And then they would have the people drink the water. So this is something in um, Tibb al-Nabawi or the prophetic medicine or history of Islam that people would recite Quran on water and then they'd have the people drink the water. So there's something in mostly all of the... Uh, in fact, everybody that I know that's trying to heal people from what they think is the effect of the shayateen, the evil jinn, they, they have them bring water, and they recite Quran and water, and then they give the water to the people to drink and do what they do with it. So that's... Um, you have any pros or cons of distilled water? Or? I don't believe in distilled water. If you're going to use distilled water, you need to add minerals to it, because it's demineralized. Yeah. That's the thing about it. And, and you should be getting some minerals from your water. Was there... Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I, I personally, but I mean, it's okay if you get it, but then you need to have, put minerals in it. I take liquid minerals anyway, so it's one of the things I recommend for everybody. Okay, so um, the, I did mention, and I want to re-mention that, the scientist, Dr. Masuro Emoto, he's a Japanese scientist who wrote many books on water, and that I think his principles, they're very Quranic, by the way. Uh, he was, they had him on, um, a talk show in Egypt, and uh, because his principles do agree with the Quranic uh, knowledge on water and our belief about water, and so um, I recommend his books, and I'll just put his name cut kind of over here to the side. Um, yeah, I'm just now noticing that that, that side is kind of gone. Okay. 
So I do, the, and you know, what, one of the things he says is that you're, we're 75, 77% water, so if you purify the water in your body, um, then you will begin to heal, you know, heal your body. And his thing is about, is just have, keeping the water flowing, the body and the water flowing, like your, the lymph system, the, the, the whole, the blood, the, you know, the blood is predominantly water. You know, blood is seawater, basically. So you have the same components of seawater, that's your blood. So um, anyways, just to keep the water flowing well in the body and um, to keep pure water in the body. So, and then to understand that, yes, if you eat a lot, which we really shouldn't be as Muslims, but if we have eat a lot of food or if you eat a lot of salt, sugar, or protein, like meats and stuff, you need more water. So, but I do not agree with people that say you gotta drink a gallon of water a day or so much water according to your body size, et cetera, et cetera. Just reduce, like we're supposed to be moderate anyway. So be moderate in our intake of food, especially the sugar, salt, and, and meats. We're not even supposed to eat a lot of meat as Muslims, though most, of, most Muslims do. But um, we're not vegetarians, but we're not high consumers of meat if we follow the sunnah of the Prophet, so that Allah the sunnah. So, um, but those things will increase our need for water because we have to dilute things. So the third law, to go on here, third law is cleanliness. And I think the, you know, we all know about being clean, inshallah. But as I said, for us as Muslims, cleanliness takes on a more spiritual aspect because as the hadith said, al-miftah al-jannah al-salat wa al miftah al-salat al-tahur that the key to the paradise is salat and the key to salat is purity. We can't pray without wudu. We can't pray without a ghusl if we happen to need it. Um, so that for us, the cleanliness is definitely tied to the acceptance of our Vedas and the, and the performance of our Vedas. And the expression, we knew it as Christians, cleanliness is next to godliness. And it was a very important thing. It's one of the things you know, still, if you go to most, almost any Christian church that I go to, you will find clean places. And you go to a lot of the massages, you will find not that case. So um, they, have, they still have a great consciousness of cleanliness in Christianity. And I actually, when you travel around the world, including down Mexico, places in South America, um, overseas, you come back here, you appreciate that consciousness of cleanliness. So, I don't know how many of you have done it, but believe me, you, you appreciate it. We still have a, um, a pretty good, and Europe still has a pretty good consciousness too, but our consciousness here just in general of cleanliness is, is pretty good. But I see it going down. The people don't leave their houses like they used to. Um, and to also understand that for us, the, the, the Tahora purity and cleanliness has more than just that physical aspect that we are talking about the purity of the thoughts, the purity of the, um, the ears, to keep our ears from listening to things that are profane, to keep our eyes from seeing things that are, are, are immoral or not good. So we're thinking about purity of many things, purity of our hearts, how we feel towards people. I just heard something on the radio this morning. I don't know if any of you have ever listened to On Being, it's an NPR show, it might be on other stations too, but it's on National Public Radio. And a woman on there, African-American woman, says she's a storytelling poet, I guess, but she said one, to her, one aspect of prayer is a loving gaze, to learn to look at people and creation with thoughts of love. And um, that that's a form of prayer. So to keep our eyes from looking meanly at people, including our children, um, from looking with negative thoughts, all of that has to do with this aspect of keeping ourselves and our souls clean. Because Allah is pure and loves purity in us. The fourth law, is the law of sunlight. So when I was talking about, you know, the um, keeping positive, the positivity in the body with breath, 
the sunlight is an aid to that. Keeps the spirits up, makes you have more hope, feel happy. Um, it also, the sun is a manifestation to us of the nur of Allah Ta'ala, the light of Allah. And as Allah says in Surah Al Nur, He says, Allahu Nur Samawati Allah, that Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Well, what we see is that when the earth turns toward the sun and we get that light, everything's illuminated. Everything, all, you know, everything. Um, and, and the sun becomes like the light of our world, but the sun is only a reflection of the light of Allah. So, you know, the, whatever we see in the power of the sun is only a fraction, a very minimal fraction of, of um, the light of Allah Ta'ala. And the sun is just amazing. I mean, absolutely. You know, I mean, just physically, what it does for us physically, as we know, you don't have life without water, you don't have strong life without the sun. These two things are essential for life, the water and the sun. You know that from plants more, but we should know that from ourselves too. So when the sun hits our skin, there's a physical reaction, the, 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 the oil underneath of the skin, the, the sunlight can convert that oil into vitamin D, which strengthens our bones. So we literally become stronger beings because of sunlight. Our spirits get elevated because of the sunlight. Um, we have um, the just watching, like if we watch the sunrise is a spiritual thing for us. It's sort of like thinking of the earth turning to, you know, in that direction and the sun then becoming, you know, more and more over us and as it begins to pass over us. But watching that and watching the interaction of sun and water, you know, I, where I live I can see sunlight on a, um, a bay. So uh, in the mornings I can see that happy interaction of the sun and the water, you know, it's like creating those, I call them the sparklies, you know, the little sparkles, and the, you know, the, just beautiful. So, and, um, and watching the birds and the, you know, that whole interaction as everything's sort of coming out of sleep and coming into life. So that's an amazing thing going on in the universe with, um, with uh, the sun and, um, it's, it's part of the Rahmah of Allah as well as a Nima. I mean, you know, as, as Allah said, if I wanted you to have night forever, could you do anything about it? Or if I wanted you to have day forever, could you do anything about it? But he gives us night and day. So we have, it's one of the, the, the blessings and um, the things that we should be grateful for. And understand, uh, I'm sorry, yes. I, I hate to keep interrupting. That's fine. But I, I not, heard not, not long ago, the uh, African Americans, we have a, uh, deficiency, a lot of us have vitamin D deficiency. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that's because we, at one time, we, we were out in the sun. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's what we, we need more sun than maybe somebody else might need. Uh, and that's what I was thinking. Well, Just reading an article about how most of us have a vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. But also, um, yeah, we used to be out in the sun more, and now see, most of us, just in this Western society, we are not out, period, you know. Children used to be out and play, now they're watching TV or they're on the computers or whatever. Humans used to be out, had more outdoor work, you know, before. Now, we, I know a, a building that I used to work in, there were no windows at all. So you couldn't get natural sunlight. You had to go outside just to, you know, and, and you know, in the winter, you go to work and it's dark and you come out of work and it's dark. And so that whole thing about of being aware of it, and yet maybe we, maybe because of our African origins where we did get more sun and we're used to more sun, that perhaps our need may be greater. But the thing about it is that is 15 to 20 minutes of that morning sun can fulfill your need. So if you got some morning sun and a little afternoon sun, you'd be all right. But I think the thing is that we're not even conscious anymore of our need for sun. We don't pay any attention to it. It doesn't seem to matter, you know, to people if they're in all day. A lot of people never open their shades or blinds. You know, they're, they're, the morning comes and the, and the window shades, the curtains close. They go, they don't open them because they're getting ready to go to work or whatever. And they come back and they never open their blinds. And they're not even realizing that it's not just you being there, but the sun does things in your house. It, you know that somebody said maybe we need some sunlight because it's a purifier. 
So it can come in and can kill germs. I'm starting to laugh a little bit because there was one of the poems this morning was about dust <laughs> and about the spiritual aspect of dust. And the woman was saying, dust is one of the cleanest things in the universe, you know? And so, um, but, but there are also bacteria and different things that um, produce, and that if sunlight hits things, it begins to purify um, the air in your home, you know, the little particles that you don't maybe see um, that could be harmful to you, but sunlight will take care of that. So it's a servant also. You know? Yes? Yes, long. I just wanted to, uh, uh, <clears throat> one was a question and the other one was a comment. Uh, the question was on, um, I was explaining to my wife what you were talking about while we were on the topic of the sun, the sunlight, mm -hmm. which is going to be dark or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it was talking about the plant, you know, because she keeps a light on one, the plant all the time. Mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, there's, it's like a new thing now. They really want, however they're doing this thing with the lights, a constant thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the thing is, it, uh, uh, Probably shouldn't say it, but I said that you know Islam is like a balance. Mm -hmm. So they got the light, but sooner or later, because I mean, I get up and I turn the light off. Then she has she runs it's the a light. mercy to the plant that you do that. Right. Well, I tell her that uh, it, it, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a plant, mm -hmm. if they growing all these things, all this light. What about the darkness too? Mm -hmm. So if God makes it, you know, the mm -hmm. darkness is a purpose for that. Too. Right. You know. So I uh, I just want you to take on that as far as the darkness with this. So mm -hmm. I, and then uh, I want just a comment on you saying with the lady about uh, the looks, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just thought it was so beautiful because I constantly tell people that all the time about the looking, mm -hmm. you know, how contagious it is. You know, driving down the street, I have just having a glance over and there's a mean looking girl frowning up. Next thing you know, I'm frowning too, you know, <laughs> and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, I glance over there's a, you know, a, a woman or whatever, or, or even a guy, you know, smile on the mm -hmm. face. Contagious, I'm smiling yeah. too, and I'll be trying to tell it to my sister, you know, mm -hmm. hey, just try to look pleasant, you know, mm -hmm. you're looking like a rock while it's contagious, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, especially behind a count of customers. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you're right. No, uh, it is true that, um, like I said, that everything needs water to live and sunlight to be strong, but again, uh, there are times for this and times to not have it. It's also advised not to feed your plants after the sun sets, after the, you know, when night comes, because that's not the time when they want to eat. They're going into their rest stage. So they have a time of life and energy and also a time of rest just like we do. And so, uh, and, you know, when, when we're going into night, all the atmosphere around us is going into a restful stage. Because when the sun comes, it energizes. It energizes the molecules and it, it, it things speed up. We get up, you know, that's, it's just a natural, universal thing. And so to get into that, like you say, the balance, and not just the balance, but the harmony with what's going on around you, you get into that sun cycle, you know. And the plants are in that sun cycle. Some of them even droop or close up when the night comes, and then they open back up and, you know, straighten back up when the day comes. So it is it's true. Nothing is supposed to have light all that time because that's just not normal. And um, everything needs its time for rest. You're gonna she's gonna overwork the poor plant, and then it'll probably have an early death. Um, so and the sun that is what is keeping our system, meaning our solar system, in order. In order. And um, there's a beautiful thing, but I can't really talk about it too much now. But understand that in Islam and in Quran that Allah has given everything um, an identity, a huwa or hiya, it's either he or her. So if everything either has a dominant masculine personality or a dominant feminine personality, and the sun is hiya. The sun is, has a dominant female personality. And in that, in her central position, that she's the one keeping everything in order. So that kind of gives us an idea of how we're supposed to function in, in society. Um, and she also is giving strength, you know? So that's the thing about the, the sun is providing that strength to the plant life and to us as physical beings also, uh, to, our, to our actual physical bodies, because again, uh, giving us vitamin D, helping to purify, you know, a wound heal better if they get sunlight. So if, when you have a wound, you don't want to keep it covered all the time, you need to get some sun in there. Um, and it also helps to create trace minerals in our body. So, the um, next law is the law of motion. And this was where we did actually ended up stopping last week. The law of motion. 
and to understand that motion also means life. Inactivity, lack of motion, is death. Emotion. No, no, motion. That everything has to be, everything has to be in movement. I mean, so it is movement that creates. See, when life starts, it vibrates. It, you know, and it's, it, it does that. You know, like it, it gets this vibration to it, and um, and, and it stays in motion from that time on. It's one of the laws of phys physics, like the body in motion tends to stay in motion, right? So, and when that motion stops, that's when it's going into death and, and dying. So, we are meant to be um, creatures of movement. And whether or not, even if I'm standing still, everything in my body is still moving. All the molecules in my body are in motion. Um, you know, all, all through the entire body. Even when you're asleep, things are in motion. So, um, that never stops until death comes. So it's a sign of life. And um, the thing for us in Islam is that there, there's um, the spiritual things as well as the um, physical things. So one of the things about movement, when we talk about how the water must move, one of the things about staying healthy is the water in your body has to stay in motion. The body, like the lymph system, doesn't have anything propelling it, like our circulatory system, like the blood is propelled by the force of the heartbeat. You know, that force is pushing it down and causing it to come back up. But the lymph system only moves with motion. So when you become less active, the lymph begins to clog up. So that that's, the motion is very important in terms of us actually walking and doing things. Then there's a hadith. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about this last time, but at this morning when I was sitting down, I started to sit down and make a couple of notes of what I needed to add in or say today, that um, there's a hadith about where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, every, every joint, there's, there's a requirement of every joint in the, in the, of the human being to give us sadaqa every day that the sun comes up. So every day that the sun presents herself. A sadaqa is required from every joint in our body. And then it goes on to say the different things that are sadaqa. You know, like um, a good word is a sadaqa, um, like, because um, it said helping someone onto their mouth. But if you would help somebody, you see somebody go into their car, and you know, they got a lot of stuff, can you say, well, can I help you? And you help them put their groceries in the trunk or whatever, that's a sadaqa. Um, removing a harmful thing from the from the road or the path is a sadaka. Sometimes you know you might pick glass if you don't want to pick it up. You'll at least get it off the sidewalk. Um, but sometimes you know you're thinking about you see glass and you're thinking, suppose a child comes down here and falls, and you don't want you want to get that glass up, or you see sticks and you realize that somebody can chip over them. At least what I tend to do is just at least kick the sticks into the grass where people won't trip over them or you know have to step over them or whatever. Um, sometimes you see things on the highway, but you can't, you're thinking about it, but you can't do it because you, you can't, you know, the traffic's going 65 miles an hour and there's a mattress in the middle. You just have to leave it there, right? You've got to go around it. You can't do anything about it. You might be able to call somebody and say, hey, can somebody come get this, you know, thing out of the road? So we do what we can and realize that everything, even uh, when we're using our, um, the joints in our fingers to make tasbih, because at least they're doing something positive. So it's like to think about your joints, and then, you know, there's, there's one place that says a smile is, is a charity, right? So looking, like you're talking about looking at people with good thoughts, you know, saying may Allah have mercy on someone, or may Allah guide them, or may Allah bless. You see somebody else do a good thing, and you, you say, may Allah bless that person for that, you know? Um, so those type of things, giving, um, Using every part of your body that you can to do something positive. When you bend your knees in, in Salat, that's, that's like your knees are doing a sadaqah for themselves. You know, like, so this is something to think about. That, um, and again, it says a good word is a sadaqah. So that because then you're using the joints of your jaws and in your mouth and everything, you're using that to say good words. So to say something nice to a person, um, to help them, again, with what they're carrying, to open the door, you know, 
I was in the Whole Foods yesterday when after I left here. And you know, I'm not that tall, so very often it happens that things I want are up on the shelf that are too high for me to get. And sometimes even if I can touch it to reach it, I'm afraid to try to pull it because it's glass, and I'm afraid it'll fall. So I was reaching for something, I think it might have been a box of the cookies that I was getting for here, and I was really stretching, I was on my you know, toes and reaching. I saw this hand come over my head, <laughs> and reach up and just grab this up. And I turn and there was this little kind of pimple-faced young guy. And I just said, thank you, you know. Because he saw me and he just automatically helped me. And this is the thing, to let this good that we do become automatic. That we see somebody and don't hesitate. Sometimes you do something good and people don't even want you to do it. They don't like it. I remember one time a, I was in an airport or something and a little boy was going towards a barrier and I went to grab it and his mother said, don't you touch him, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm obviously, you know, she was European American and I'm, she didn't want me to touch her child. And I'm like, well then you need to be sure that he's safe. I'm just trying to help him. So sometimes people don't want it, but you want your goodness to become automatic. So, you know, inshallah, to be thinking of that, you know, what did my hands do today? What did my eyes do of good today? What did I say of good for somebody? Sometimes, because I'm a, I like, I believe in writing. I believe in keeping that act of penmanship alive. So sometimes in the morning I'll sit down and write a couple of notes to someone. And then I know at least that my hands did something good that day. If I don't do anything else, of course if I do with do, inshallah this is considered an act of, of good for myself, but to do it for somebody, do good for somebody else. Because it says Allah loves the good that you do that makes someone else happy. Not just what's good for you, but to do good for someone else. So that is a law and um, and to remember that in motion and exercise when you think about it physically it says very often some exercise is better than medicine and when you do good it said the person doing the good very often benefits more than the receiver and that, and that is so true sometimes the receiver doesn't truly appreciate it but Allah gives you a barakah for any good that you think, any good that you do, any good that you speak, the good that you want to do and can't do, you're still getting some blessing, blessing for it. So keep that in, uh, in the mind. And also um, to be active in the spiritual way also, in what we, you know, in the listening and the looking. And Allah is always asking us, alam um, yara, don't you see or don't they see? Um, he wants us to listen or, you know, as would like listen. And um, so Allah wants us to be active in all kinds of ways. In our belief, our iman, in our, uh, our, with our ears, with our eyes, all of these things. Okay? So, um, and also with our, our um, defector, you know, reflection. We need to be active in that also, in our taqwa. So, law number six which is really supposed to be what we're doing today, six and seven, is diet. And um, the, the reason that I'm going to be, probably you will think maybe even too brief with this, is because to get into diet is a whole day. To really talk about, to do justice to this law is, is pretty extensive. But in the Quran, the basic, the basic law for this, the basic ayah, ayah, excuse me, the basic ayah for this particular law, the law of diet, is found in Surah Al-Baqarah, and it's ayah 168. And that is the one where Allah Ta'ala is speaking to Ya Yohannes, all of humanity, not just the believers, all of humanity. And he is saying, Allah Ta'ala says, Ya Yohannes, Oh, you human beings, eat from the earth what, I, what is permissible and beneficial. And don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Surely he's an enemy to you. Now in the Arabic, which we almost can't say it that way in English, but in the Arabic, there is nothing between the halal and the tayyib. Halal and tayyib. They're, they're together. There's no wa in between, you know, no and to connect these two adjectives or qualities of the food. 
um, in English we say permissible and beneficial, but you could say permissible, permissible and then put a comma and say beneficial. But to say it in a, for us to use our language and say it properly, we put the and in there. But in Arabic there is no and. So, and my understanding of, as I asked about it, as it was explained to me, is that because one is a quality of the other. You cannot put a, a separation or division between the halal and the tayyib. So we as believers, Muslims, I'm not even going to talk about the people in general, I'm talking about us right now. Um, when we are thinking about food or purchasing food, we've, our focus is on halal. We want what is halal, what is permissible to us by Allah Ta'ala. And for the most part, we forget about the tayyib. We're not paying attention. You know, we used to be a lot better about this when uh, I came through a nation of Islam. Some, some of you came through a nation of Islam. We used to be better about this when we were in a nation. Reading labels, you know, ignoring certain foods because we knew they were not good for us. So we, we just, if, if they told us, don't eat collard greens, don't eat sweet potatoes, whatever they said, don't eat. We were like, cool, we don't eat. Now, you know, we don't read the labels anymore for the most part. And corp companies, even companies that we used to think were okay, if you read the labels now, you will probably find it's not okay anymore. Um, that they have included some things that are no longer targeted. So we have to get, we have to improve ourselves in that aspect to be sure that we become as particular about the tayyib as we are about the halal. Because Allah Ta'ala says in Quran, and this is the thing about using Quran as a holistic document, I made permissible for you what is good for you. And so you can get the reverse of that. Whatever is not good for you is not halal for you. So the thing is that we, many of us are consuming what in, according to Quranic principles, would be haram because we're not paying attention to the talib. So then in terms of diet, um, there are ayat in Quran, there, in fact, right after Ayah 172, book just a few beyond this, that are addressed to Ya Ayyuhaladina Amanu. And in that ayah, Allah doesn't even put the word halal in there. He says, Ya Ayyuhaladina Amanu, Kulumina Tayyibat. Like, um, eat of the, the good and wholesome things. So, because that's all that is permissible to us. So, this is the thing we have to understand. Also, there's an ayah in Quran. Um, Surah al An'am, I believe, about the eating, uh, the athmara, the, the um, eating things as they become ripe. So we should, in, and when you look at that, in order to eat things as they are ripened and ready, you can't get things from, you know, Peru, um, Korea, wherever, I don't know, fish out of the waters in Vietnam that we don't need. Because um, we're, we're surrounded by water, you know, so why are we getting Vietnamese fish and Korean fish and Chinese, whatever, apricots? Um, we should be eating from things that are around us. So this whole thing about local, you know, eating local, at least things that can be trucked in within a day or so, this is very important because then we're following the chronic principles to eat what is um, as it's becoming ripe. So they can be picked as it's becoming ripe and gotten to us within a day so that we can have actual good food. Because what happens without that, we're getting not just the, see the food, the, the, the fruit of the plant needs to ripen on the plant to get the nourishment. Like the plant is the mother and the fruit is the child, okay? So it has to get from the mother the, the things that it needs for it to be beneficial to us. So that's why we're getting, you know, this artificial stuff. We got these things, oh, they, sometimes they even inject in color. The apple is so red and perfect, and the orange is so nice, and no, no lumps or spots. And um, the banana is, a, you know, which we shouldn't even be eating bananas in the winter. That's a tropical fruit. We're not a tropical place. But um, like all of these things, but then you cut it, and you bite into it, and there's no taste. It tastes like plastic. And one scientist told me it is plastic, because they've done so much artificial stuff to it, it's not even real. So. We're really harming ourselves by not paying attention. And if we stop buying certain things and start looking to the farmers and you know other people and giving our money to them, 
Believe me, the stores will start to get better food for us because they don't want to go out of business. It's all about the money. So when you let your money speak for you. <coughs> um, so in one of the things I want to remind us about is that in everything that we're doing, um, we're moving to, in order to live our lives as, as Muslim, that we move between Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. That's just the way it is. And when we want to talk about it, we move between Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Prophet. As I brought in those Hadith earlier. So when we want to talk about diet, Allah Ta'ala gives us guidelines in the Quran and then we look to how did the Prophet وسلم, eat? How did he instruct us to eat? Well, one of the things is that um, the dua, you know, we get that from the Prophet Muhammad. To how to say, you know, uh, the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim over the food, or to make that dua, you know, Allahumma barak lana fi ma razaqtana wa qina adab al Bless us with the food that you have provided us and save us from the penalty of the fire. And believe me, eating wrongly can cause can be a cause for us to end up in the na, because only the purity of ourselves can enter the jannah. So if we have to be purified because of wrong eating, guess how that's going to be done? Very often. Um, so the thing that the Prophet taught us to pray over our food, the Quran teaches us to be grateful for our food. That's in at, that ayah 172, because when, he, then when it says, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, kulu min ta'ibati ma razaq, eat of the good things we provided for you, wa lillah, and be grateful to Allah. So that's 172 in this surah of Baqarah also. Wa shkuru lillah in kuntum yahu ta'abudun. If you, if you worship Allah, then be grateful to Allah for the food and the drink that is given. So that's why we have a du'a. And we learned that du'a from the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. You know, Alhamdulillahi alladhi at'amana wa saqana wa ja'adana muslimin. Who gave us food and gave us drink and made us Muslims. That's what we say after we eat. So the, for the Muslim, our food and drink is supposed to be surrounded by du'a. And when you surround this, these things with du'a, then that improves the quality and also improves the benefit that it will give to you. Because if you eat, you can't eat dead stuff. If you eat dead stuff, it won't give you any life. So, you, so there's some life in this food that will respond to the du'a and the prayer that you're making on it. Uh, so the, one of the, in the guideline of the Prophet, as I mentioned, he said that we, our consumption should be one-third food, one-third water, and one-third air. Right? So we're never supposed to eat, as believers, believing people, we're never supposed to eat until we're full. We're supposed to leave room for that deep breath, the air, because that will help our digestion. So, and also to, um, to leave time, not to eat too frequently. You know, we kind of, we're a snacking society, you know. If you go in the store, you see we're a snacking society, all those pretzels, chips, popcorn, you know, cookies, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of snacks in there. Um, so, but when you don't leave enough time between the consumption of food, you overload your body and you overwork your digestive system from the stomach to the small intestine to the colon to everything. You're overworking, even in terms of the saliva, salivary And also glands. in one of the uh, guidance of the Prophet وسلم, is to eat with our right hands to eat with our right hands. And even if you're left-handed, you can learn to eat with your right hand. I have a brother that's left-handed, and he eats with his right hand. I don't know if they just naturally, or because of Islam. I, I don't remember if he was doing that before, but I know that as a Muslim, he's eating with his right hand. But I see a lot of left-handed people still eating with their left hand in Islam, and feeding their children, feeding babies with their left hands. But we know we're supposed to use our left hand to clean ourselves after elimination. And so, um, even though we wash our hands, still we try to eat with the right hand because it's sunnah. And whatever you do, as Allah says, you know, use the, take the Prophet as your um, example. So whatever you do, because it says the, Allah, uh, in, in, in Quran there's an ayah that says if in, that um, the Prophet is saying, if you love Allah, then follow me. Like follow the Prophet. Do so we follow the example of the Prophet and it says, Allah, Allah will love you. So that in order to help garner the love of Allah, we begin to do as much as we can of what the Prophet did. So um, 
and, and in the diet, which is a very, very important part of our lives, in, in the medicine of the prophet, he said all of, the, it, all of the illness begins in the stomach. So, you know, it's something to really think about, that how important the diet is in keeping us healthy. It's important, and you know, the other um, talk that I did here was about food and ibeda, like how our diet is related to our worship. Not just in being able to worship, you know, we know more in Ramadan than any other time. If we don't eat properly, if we overeat in Ramadan, doing that Salat al Isha and that Salat al Tarwi is a little difficult because you're uncomfortable. So, that in order to keep up our Ibeda, we really need to be careful about how we eat. Okay, so I'm not going to spend much more time on that. Um, so, the final law is the law of rest. That's the seventh law. And all of these things are absolutely like you must have them and you must have them in balance. And um, these are requirements for us to have health. So the seventh law is the law of rest. That everything, as we mentioned, has its time of activity and its time of rest. And those little plants and flowers also have to have so the law of rest. Allah Ta'ala said the, in Quran that um, he is the one that made the night for us to rest. This is from Surah 10, Surah Yunus. He made the night for us to have second, to be calm and peaceful and rest in it. That's one of the, one of the purposes of the night. Um, and in this, is, it says in this there is an ayah for us. And the ayah says, they call me yasma'un. If you're listening, if you're paying attention, you will get a sign from this. That we, the day is uh, for us to be active and the night is for us to rest. Now, knowing this and knowing that this is the natural way, there are, professions and um, times when you might have to be up. Oh. There are times when you have to be up when you should be sleeping. But that should not be like a constant. I, I know like it used to be the, what they called swing shifts. Like sometimes you would be on that 11 to 7, but you weren't on that all the time. You used to alternate and change, right? You come out of it. Now they put people on 11 to 7, and they stay there for years. And that's not normal, because that means they never get to really sleep when their bodies are supposed to regenerate. You know, you have a gland in the body, a pineal gland, that only regenerates at night and only regenerates in the dark. So if, like, if you're working in a hospital, and you know usually in hospitals you've got a bunch of fluorescent lights and stuff, and you're walking around, and that's your job, and you stay on that job, your pineal gland basically never gets a chance to, re to regenerate because it regenerates at night in the dark. So even though it's nighttime, because you're under a bunch of lights and artificial light, that, you know, which is all that can be at night, right? Except when you're under full moon. Um, you're, that gland is going to start to degenerate and that gland is what regulates your pituitary gland, which regulates the, the uh, endocrine system. So then you, you're setting yourself up for disease. So it's like, so when you have to do it, like firemen, police officers, nurses, doctors, people like that, when you have to do it, you need to switch with people somehow that you're not on that shift all the time. And when you're in a system that is going to require you to stay on that, you need to get out of it. Because you're realizing this is not normal. This is not the way, this is not the cycle that Allah wrote for me as a human being in this world. So we have to stop submitting ourselves to the abnormal because we're ruining our own health. Um, these are things, I don't know what happened to, this, to the society. It used to be better than it was, okay? So, um, so we have to have the rest. So then what happens is that people are sleeping when they should be active, right? Just sleeping in the day when, when the energy in the universe is high and, and then you're pushing against that and so it's, it's really uh, making us really off balance. When we talk about the mizan and the balance and everything and the harmony with the creation, we're, we're, all, out of, we're all out of sync with that. So, and you know, just a few 
it may still be, that sleep deprivation is one of the big problems in, in this society. There was one time when that was the, the, the one of the biggest health problems was sleep deprivation. Um, so because without that, you don't um, regenerate, you don't restore. Um, you have to have these things just for your organs to regenerate, for to restore, for body to reset itself, you know, all of this. So the um, times for sleep, Allah chose the times for our sleep and our rest. It's not for us to just choose. And also to know what helps the sleep. Like I said, breathing helps us to rest better. So before, if you have a problem sleeping, try some deep breathing with tespia before you know, you're getting um, ready for sleep. Also, don't eat too close to the time that you're going to go to bed. Um, and if you're really, really hungry, try to eat something light and at least not lay down for at least an hour or so. You really need two hours to properly digest your food. So you want to you want to um, not go to bed with a full stomach. That first of all, you won't sleep well. Probably you have some crazy dreams, and um, you wake up, you know, bad taste in the mouth and different things. So. You know, they have something in, in Spain, I think it's, they call it the paseo, they do it in the night, like take a short walk before they want to go in a house and rest. So getting fresh air also is very good. Um, also, there are times that are better to sleep. Before midnight is when you get more benefit from your rest. So it says one hour of sleep before midnight is equivalent to two after. And a 15 minute nap in the day is equal to 45 minutes of night rest. So those power naps, that's for real. You know, just get a power nap. And that's also sunnah, because the Prophet ﷺ, he used to um, take a, um, like, pray salat al and take a nap. You know, so that afternoon nap is, is part of, of the sunnah. And to understand that resting is not always sleep. So if you have a job that um, requires a lot of mental activity, then you need to get up and take a rest from that mental strain to do a little physical thing. Take a short walk, um, you know, do some yoga or whatever, but get up and do something different. And uh, I know this personally, I you know, I do a lot of research and stuff, and so sometimes I forget to take a break. And I remember one time I actually felt like I had a mental blowout, you know. I was preparing for a, a retreat. And when I got to that retreat, I mean, I was gone, and it took me a long, it took me several months to recover after that. I could not do any, um, like, really strong mental focus for a couple of months after that. So it's, it's like, even if you get up, and just to take a break, go get a drink of water, go do, you know, 10, you know, la ilaha illallah, la sharika la, go do something, walk around, but don't just stay focused with such intensity because uh, you need a break. So sometimes rest is change. And if you've been doing hard physical work, then go take a break and do something, you know, soft and light. Sit down, put your feet up, listen to a little, you know, Quran music, any, anything that sort of brings some calm and peace. Um, also, when we talk, we mentioned alkalinity, we talked about alkaline water. Rest helps to bring that acid alkaline balance back into the body. So sometimes, the excess acid in our bodies is because of the stress and this push to keep going when we need to take a break. Things that we do to ourselves that we're not even aware of, you know? So again, following the laws. And to understand that your home is supposed to be a place of peace. When you go home, you're supposed to be able to find sakina there. So the people in your home, your wife, your children, your family, this is supposed to be one of the places where you get this peace. Um, and Allah made the homes for that purpose, for you to be able to go in and get away from the stresses and anxieties of the society and get back into your house and feel at peace. Okay? So if you don't have it, you try to create it. Um, so, so that is, and then I have what I call the supervisory law. The law that supervises everything else. So these are seven laws. So I don't call this an eighth law. This is just sort of like the umbrella over everything. Um, and that is um, trust. Tawakkul. You know when we say, um, 
just depend upon Allah. Put all your trust in Allah and don't worry about anything else. Um, and the thing to, to trust the most is that our health is dependent upon Allah, as Prophet Ibrahim said in, in Surah al um, Sha'ara, the poets, that he says, When I get sick, he, meaning Allah, is the one who heals me. So I need to follow the laws, I need to do the best that I can, and when I get sick, I depend upon Allah. And I look to uh, the help of Allah first before anyone else. So that every approach to health, any approach to health has to go through Allah and in accordance with the laws of Allah. And then um, if there's a ayah, where is this from? I don't write this sort of down here, but it says, in yansurukum uh, Allah, if Allah helps you, fala ghalib alakum. If Allah helps you, there's nothing that can conquer you. So when you depend upon Allah, you ask for Allah's help with, with your health and well-being, then inshallah he will guide you to what you need and he will bring you uh, from a state of sickness into health if you happen to get sick. And that dependence is absolutely necessary because without that, without that tawakkal, without depending on Allah is the wakil, we begin to look to all other crazy sources for help. And believe me, you will not find it. You will get temporary relief, but before you know it, you will be back in a state of sickness again. But when Allah brings you out of sickness into health, that's a permanent thing. That's a definite thing. That's something you can depend on. So I have this one quote from this Natural Remedies Encyclopedia that I want to read. It is the duty of every person for his or her own sake and for the sake of humanity, I'm going to explain that in a minute, for the sake of humanity to inform themselves in regards to the laws of life. And these are the laws of life. Health is life. To inform themselves in regard to the laws of life and to conscientiously obey them. Now why does it say for their own sake, for his or her own sake, and for the sake of humanity? Because when you keep yourself healthy, by following the laws, you keep all of humanity healthy. There is no separation between myself and you, and you, and every other human being. Whatever I do that is beneficial for me, benefits humanity as a whole. We are nefsin wahedet. We are one soul. If, and Allah says he created us as one soul, and then he says he will, uh, our ba'ath, our raising up is going to be ka nefsin wahedet, like one soul. We didn't move from our origins as one soul, which is in Surah al said, to our end as one soul. So every good that I do for myself, I benefit all of the, all of the society, all of humanity. So look to, you, to doing good for you and understand that that is a universal good. And, um, and that's it. And if, if you have any other comments or questions, I can entertain them now. I just would like to know how to spell the brain that regenerates the blood. Pineal. It's P I N E A L. The pineal gland. Some people say pineal. Pineal gland? Yeah. And that's called the master gland. That's your real master gland um, because it governs your pituitary. Also, this is like the spiritual gland. The third eye, is it called something? Sometimes I think, yeah. <clears throat> this also regulates your um, the rhythm of your system, like your sleep-wake cycle. That's why it's so important. It produces that mel melatonin naturally. It produces melatonin, but only if it can, you know, regenerate itself. Can it continue to release the uh, melatonin, which some people want to give to you synthetically or whatever? But um, so yeah, these are um, so important. And so many aspects, I think, like so many details and things that we don't know or that if we know, we forget and we forget to think about them. So um, I think I only I think I only brought like five of these, but these are the organ regeneration charts. So um, I can get copies. Huh? Oh, you can? Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll give to my sister. <laughs> So, Jazakallah, I really appreciate you um, 
you know, coming out and okay, I gave him one so Thank you. two left. And Salam alaikum alameen. Of course, if I made any mistakes, then you know this is from me because as I said, Allah Ta'ala, perfect. Everything with Allah, haq and uh, perfect, absolute perfection. So we know that there are no errors from our Creator. Thank you.